I would love to um, welcome everyone today to uh, balance this uh, webinar entitled Veganism and Eating Disorders, Challenges and Myths. Um, my name is Leslie Davenport and I am the Clinical Outreach Coordinator at Balance Eating Disorder Treatment Center in New York City. And um, we really welcome all of you today um, and thank you for joining us and taking the time to share these next 90 minutes that we're gonna be together. Um, and you know, we have a very special topic, a unique topic today. Over the last few years, we've seen veganism trending at an all time high and um, individuals who are following a vegan diet are seeking out eating disorder treatment in increasing numbers. It's very noticeable. Uh, we're seeing it much more um, in the inquiries that we're receiving at Balance. Um, and this is a subject that our presenter, Melanie Rogers, chose to take on long before many in our field were speaking on this topic and before veganism became as widely practiced as it is today. Um, in fact, Melanie has teamed up with renowned dietitian Tammy Beasley of Alsana Treatment Center and their work has contributed to our field, leading us to provide treatment to far more vegans than ever before. So for example, Alsana Eating Disorder Treatment Center treated 100 vegans last year alone, people who otherwise, they otherwise wouldn't have been able to get care. And at Balance, we work with vegan clients who often have had difficulty finding treatment centers that have a real expertise in supporting vegans in their pathway to recovery. Um, so this is something that's really been, um, I think our field is embracing more and it's a complex subject and I'm very excited to uh, have Melanie speak on this today. I did want to just let you know a few housekeeping matters. Um, today will be a webinar presentation, but we definitely encourage you to ask questions. So you can submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, you'll see. And also we welcome questions and comments through the chat box that um, all can see. Um, and also today's webinar is being recorded. So you will all receive an email after today's event um, with the link to the recording. And it's also gonna be available on Balance's YouTube channel. So without further ado, I am now going to introduce Melanie Rogers to you, just tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Melanie Rogers is a certified eating disorder registered dietitian and clinical supervisor in the treatment of eating disorders accredited by the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. She is the founder and CEO of Balance Eating Disorder Treatment Center and Melanie Rogers Nutrition right here in New York City. Melanie is a professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies at New York University. And she is the founder and past president of the New York City chapter of the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals, or IADEP, we call it, and an advisory board member at the Center for the Study of Anorexia and Bulimia. Mulaney is an active member of several dietetic associations, including the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the Greater New York Dietetic Association, and the International Federation of Eating Disorder Dietitians, or IFED. As a practitioner in her own recovery, she is passionate about providing the highest quality treatment services to those struggling with eating disorders and is dedicated to supporting others in their quest to achieve long-term recovery. So with that, I will now turn it over to Melanie. Leslie, thank you for very much for that, that really lovely introduction. Um, and welcome to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, again, my name is Melanie Rogers, and as Leslie alluded to, really the pivotal point for me around um, wanting to explore more about our field, our field as in, in the dietetic field and specifically in the eating disorder field, I wanted to explore a little bit more around our tendency or our, our kind of mainstream attitude, which was we were not, at, um, several years ago, we were not willing to treat vegan clients because we felt that it was a manifestation of an eating disorder. So as you can tell just from that statement, a lot of assumptions there. Um, and myself having had my own lived experience and when I had my eating disorder, I became vegetarian because it was easier to therefore, it was very socially acceptable to then be able to say, no, thank you, I don't eat that. And does that have meat in it? Well, I can't eat that. So I kind of knew the smoke and mirrors. 
Um, but as we well know, um, just because that's your lived experience doesn't mean that that is the case for everyone. And so it's important for us always to look at the broader picture. And really the pivotal piece of information that started to help me really challenge this was when I heard the statistic that for clients who present for treatment and for whatever reason are denied treatment or they decide that treatment isn't the right match for them, it can take up to two years for them to then represent for treatment again. Two years, if in fact they ever do come back for treatment. And for me, that statistic was heartbreaking and actually unacceptable. And so I realized that we were creating a barrier by saying we're not going to treat vegans. We were creating a barrier for more people to get care. And so that really began, began the, the research part of this to really see, can we do this? Not, not just can we weight restore people if that's what they need, but can we actually re-nourish the brain? And so those are some of the big questions uh, that we'll go through today with what we found from our research. I say we because um, my dear friend and colleague, Tammy Beasley, um, I reached out to her around this and said, Tammy, we need to really look into this. And so she and I kind of delve into this together and then started doing some presentations and we've done some great research around it. And as Leslie shared with you, Alsana, which is where Tammy is the nutrition director, um, they've really leaned into providing veganism there, as have we. We both set up our own protocols and, um, and pilot studies. And uh, they were able to treat over 100 vegans last year. That's 100 people that may not have otherwise gotten treatment. And at Balance, we've certainly been able to do the same. And what we have found, interestingly, um, and thank goodness, is as we were able to suggest that maybe we had been making this barrier inappropriately, perhaps, or or more, more accurately, we had this barrier up to treating vegans that was based upon misinformation and um, not all the data. Um, and so I'm thrilled to see that other treatment centers are now starting to treat vegans. So thrilled about that and not just treat vegans, but hopefully treat them with some of the essential pieces that we need to know about when we're talking about veganism. So that's what we'll be exploring today. So stay tuned. Let me share my screen with you. Leslie, could you just let me know that you're able to see this properly? Can everyone see that? Leslie, are you able to see that? I am. Perfect. Great. So today, veganism and eating disorders, challenges and myths. And as we go into, sorry, our discussion points, um, discussion point number one, what are the reasons one might become a vegan? Is there a difference between an ethical vegan and a dietary vegan? Number two, is there a relationship between veganism, orthorexia and eating disorders? Number three, does veganism increase someone's risk for, de for developing an eating disorder? A huge question for us. Is veganism a socially acceptable way to justify food restriction? And number five, can a vegan meal plan provide the caloric requirements and the essential nutrients necessary for weight restoration and overall nourishment? And our last question is, can someone suffering from an eating disorder who is vegan fully recover and still be vegan? So we're going to try to answer um, some of these, most all of these questions today. Um, and I would love to hear your comments as we go through. Uh, Leslie has access to the chat box, so she'll be able to let me know as we go along. And, uh, and really looking forward to that, those questions and thoughts. Trends and definitions. Let's just look at the definitions first, because actually, honestly, they're not very clear. Um, so our starting point is, as many of you have heard, if you are reading anything at the moment um, or over the last few years, we're all focused on plant-based diet, plant-based diet. What does that mean? It's an umbrella term that encompasses both vegetarianism and veganism. And you've, yeah, I'm sure you've heard it a lot. So not to be confused, plant-based diet doesn't mean I'm vegan. It also doesn't mean I'm vegetarian necessarily. So we should not assume there. So um, this page, I know it's very uh, heavy on all the, the, uh, the words here, but let's go through it to just get a sense. Vegetarianism is not just, I don't eat meat. 
Um, there are lots of different varieties of vegetarians. And this is again, based upon the research of what we've seen. And also just anecdotally, probably what you've heard from clients or just your own practices or from uh, those joining us who are not in the profession, um, but seeking more knowledge, I'm sure just from friends and family and on social media. So vegetarian, if we, if we start with, okay, eating, not eating meat, but it's actually not technically true. So someone who says I'm an ovo vegetarian means that they do eat eggs. Okay. A lacto vegetarian is someone who includes milk products. So that would be cheese and milk, etc. A lacto ovo means both of the above. Okay, so all of that, I think for many of us um, would say, okay, that's all fine because in, in the, my definition of vegetarianism, that, it, those, that isn't meat, that isn't actually flesh from an animal. So I'm, I'm okay with that. But then we have pesco vegetarians, people who eat fish, but still um, call themselves vegetarian. And we also have polar vegetarians, which are people who eat meat, chicken specifically and still classify themselves as a vegetarian. So as you can see, possibly the polo and even the pesco vegetarians are really people who don't eat red meat um, and classify themselves as a vegetarian. So a bit confusing, which means us as clinicians um, need to, when a client says I'm vegetarian, we absolutely need to ask some more questions there to find out what that means. And also, does it mean that when you feel like you're eating well, well, um, is this how you eat? But what if you're not eating as well as you want to? Would you swerve into being less vegetarian? So it gets confusing. Vegan, to, to differentiate. It's the practice from abs of abstaining from the use of all animal products. And that includes red meat, poultry, fish, dairy, eggs, and other animal origin foods like gelatin and honey in even wines, for example, because they're filtered using um, uh, like a bone, a, a piece of bone type of um, product from animals. So as you can see there, it takes vegetarianism and goes to a whole other level. And the, the classical definition of veganism is includes a part two, and that is it's an, it has an associated philosophy that rejects the commodity status of animals. And so therefore there's an ethical piece to veganism. That is the so-called classic um, definition of veganism. However, what we're seeing is in a similar way to vegetarianism, which has now got a lot of different definitions around it or encompassing it. We're now seeing that some people come into us and they don't eat animal products, but they're wearing leather. So maybe we would call that person a dietary vegan versus an, ethic, ethically, an ethical vegan. I think for um, the purists out there, some might say, well, if you don't have the ethical piece along with it, you can't call yourself a true vegan. I'm not going to get into that debate. I, my goal is to meet our clients where they are and say, okay, that's great. Are you nourishing yourself adequately? That's really what I'm mostly concerned with. However, if the client is a dietary vegan versus an ethical vegan, um, I definitely want to know a little bit more around motivation and core beliefs because there might be something there that might be more smoke and mirrors than something else. Okay, so those are definitions. Hang on to that, though, because that's incredibly important as we go forward. Veganism um, didn't just start. I know it may feel that way, but it was first referenced um, over a thousand years ago, veganism, the term was first coined by a researcher, Don Watson, back in 1944. And then we've certainly seen uh, a great deal of interest has increased since the 2010s. And in fact, I think the last four years in a row, veganism has been the number one food trend, according to um, industry surveys. So I think it's no surprise veganism continues to be the number one food trend. I see a question there. I'm just going to um, open that up. And the question is, with, will this webinar be posted online? It certainly will be. And Leslie will let you know more about that. Okay, so moving along here. What's behind the current demand? Well, from a, a a survey done in 2018, nearly 50% of Americans support a ban on slaughterhouses. 
Uh, this quote I think is interesting because it points to a little bit of why. Uh, the quote is, if you're wondering just why the American vegan market is shooting up, it's probably due to animal welfare concerns. Despite the fact that more than 50% of Americans continue to eat meat, it seems that they would be more than happy if the option wasn't there at all, which is quite interesting. Now, this is 2018. Fast forward in the last two to three years, we have seen a plethora of new vegan meats come out on the market, which I think is a direct response to this. Interestingly, a lot of those vegan meats are being produced by uh, traditional uh, meat processing companies. So they're, they're kind of hedging their bets. They're cashing in on both meat eaters and the vegan population as well. My synopsis, or not synopsis, my conceptualization about what's, what's brought us here is I think the a combination of three key things. I think, uh, and as indicated by these three upward arrows on the left-hand side of this slide, first and foremost, for the last at least three decades, um, there's been a whole state of the nation public health um, outcry or um, concern for sure, um, and a great emphasis on this idea that America, but globally, um, the population is becoming more and more overweight and using the word obesity as well. I use that word just because that is what the public health campaigns are using. We don't tend to use those words uh, anymore in um, the field of eating disorders. But the general consensus was this trend was not healthy. Then I would say we, I would like to combine, combine that with the increasing transparency around food industry practices. And I think we've all been absolutely shocked and horrified through the documentaries that have come out over the last couple of decades. Michael Moore in particular has done a couple of really terrifying, terrifying, I use that word. Uh, I, think, I think that's not an exaggeration of how upsetting it's been. Um, a real expose types of, type of documentaries, a number of books have come out and of course a lot of articles that we're seeing a lot of overuse of hormones and antibiotics and to toxins and of course animal cruelty. And as a result of that, if you look at any of your food labels, there's been a great emphasis on emphasizing it's organic, no hormones, no antibiotics, no GMOs, it just goes on and on. Um, in response to the public outcry that we don't, we want our food to be clean, um, and we certainly don't want animals hurt um, in the production of this food. And then if we combine that with social media and social media has the ability for people to portray uh, quite a curated, happy, happy, healthy, healthy, uh, balanced um, picture of themselves. And also it's the go-to source of how to you know, veganism, how do I become a vegan? So the access to information readily at our fingertips or in our pocket from our phone, it's all there. So it's very easy to, um, to, to find out about the current trends and, uh, and be interested in those. And then I've also put there for our own interest of how social media has come about in the last really 20 years from the Google search, which now allows us to Google veganism, to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Insta, Snapchat, and of course, TikTok, which is, seems to be everyone's favorite at the moment. Now, if you put those three together, I think that that's really pushed us into this, this period now where it's much more about quality of life, healthy eating, illness prevention, longevity, disease-free, and of course, you know, clean, the cleanness or the organic aspects of our food and animal welfare. And then, uh, you know, a timeline here of the different, the different eating fads that have then come about over the decades. So for example, when I was a kid, my grandmother, I remember her drinking Tab, which is I think one of the first sugar-free sodas to come out on the market and a great emphasis on sugar-free. And then of course, we went into the fat-free period where fat-free milk, fat-free yogurt, fat-free this, fat-free that, followed by sugar-free low carb. I remember Atkins being really big here in America in 2000. Of course, it was the third or fourth iteration of Atkins because I think that was around since the 80s or 70s, excuse me. 
but it became this whole low carb thing, which meant by default, high protein. And Atkins was all about actual animal products and meat, generally speaking. That was then followed by a, okay, this is not great. Let's move towards more plant-based, vegetarian, high protein, more into the non-meat uh, movement, which led us to veganism and is then kind of starting to really proliferate this eating pattern we're seeing in our field that we're calling orthorexia, which is really obsessively an obsessive focus on clean eating and healthy eating to the point that it becomes disruptive to your health and your life. So on a spectrum, starts out with good intent and then it starts to get really, really um, problematic for people. So um, that's a, just a, a rough um, outline as I see it. What I want to now look at is, okay, so let's have a look at, I, I know we know this, but just let's have a look at the impact of celebrities on food, health and lifestyle choices, particularly around veganism. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but, you know, the wonderful Beyonce and Jay-Z, um, two, two years ago, I think it was, yeah, 2019, um, almost exactly two years ago, they shared a post revealing uh, the Green Print Project, which was basically a project encouraging, encouraging individuals to adopt a plant-based diet to reduce their environmental footprint, which I love that. I lo I'm all about that, right? Um, but it's so interesting about how that then was a huge influencer on people, um, people becoming more vegan. And also further, if people did, they could actually uh, win free tickets. I mean, I would sign up for that. But what I wanted to point out to you as I was just looking at this last night in preparation for today, I just went on Instagram last night to see how many followers does Beyonce have at this moment. She has 171 million followers. That's more people than voted for any president, I think, ever. Um, in fact, almost double. In fact, it is double if not more, um, this lovely lady and amazing celebrity has a heck of a lot of influence as does Jay-Z. So I'm just, I'm just putting that out there. Um, other celebrities who follow a vegan diet along with Beyonce, you may recognize some of these people. I've put Al Gore in there because I think he's a bit, a bit of a celebrity with his uh, environmental um, advocacy work that he does. And then athletes. And I mean, Serena Williams, I think, has the title as uh, one of the most standout athletes of all time. Um, and she and her sister Venus um, are following a vegan eating plan. That's pretty influential, guys. That's the, and that says a lot to people who, you know, um, look at uh, our celebrities, look at our athletes and, uh, and want to simulate or copy what they're doing in order to pursue a healthier life for themselves. Okay, so moving on there to, so, so as you can see, the impact of celebrity is very high. We know this, but I think when we see it in pictures, um, I think it has an impact. And now the impact of media trends. And again, we know this, but I think visually this tells a really powerful story. What I'd like you to look at here, this is um, just a Google search, um, a compilation of state by state how many uh, people Googled for uh, different diets between the, the period of 2006 and 2015? Unfortunately, there's not a new composition that's been done by this amazing um, researcher. Her name is Julia Belouz. She works at Vox. Um, she's one of their lead um, health, uh, uh, excuse me, um, contributors. Um, but anyway, what I want you to look at here on this um, map of the US of A is I'd like you to look out for the purple. So I'm going to lead you through an example of the gluten-free diet period, which was very prominent during this uh, almost 10 year range. So starting off with the purple, you see it kind of here in the middle. And then I want you to follow it over the next few years. Lots of purple happening on Google search through 2009. 2011, almost most of America is now Googling gluten-free diets and 2015, even more so. That 
is I think that is so powerful with how a trend can just proliferate and then everyone's Googling for the same thing. I would suggest, and I looked for a similar um, composition like this for veganism, because I would suggest we'd see the exact same thing with the current years, but I wasn't able to find anything for today. But what I wanted to show you is as a result of that whole gluten-free phase there and people really getting into that um, way of eating, uh, when they actually, when we actually did some research on this, we meaning the, the field, the reasons for purchasing, purchasing gluten-free foods, uh, if you look at this survey or the survey results, on the far left side that's circled there, 35% of people said they're purchasing gluten-free foods for no reason. And then next to that, it's a healthier option. And those who actually had a gluten sensitivity was right at the other end, 8%. So, I mean, I know that this may sound obvious and I think anecdotally we, we get a sense of this, but I think this graph really captures just how powerful food trends and eating trends and diet trends can be on influencing the general population. Uh, and I put that out there because veganism has a lot of great things about it with the environmental component in particular and the desire to be healthier. I think no one can fault those. But I'm also just adding an extra layer of nuance of um, what is the true motivation for people to be following these, these eating pa patterns. So connections. Is there a connection between orthorexia, veganism, and eating disorders? So first and foremost, I'd like to just lay out here for you a little bit of what we view as disordered eating on the spectrum, or at least this is how I conceptualize it. On the one hand, we have so-called normal eating, whatever that is, but there are some broad strokes that we feel um, kind of um, uh, help define what normal eating is. And those are a neutral relationship with food. We do feel that all foods fit. Um, which means that my Doritos are just as important to me <laughs> as my broccoli. And, uh, and I know that processed foods get a bad rap, but again, all foods fit in moderation. Intuitive eating, eating from hunger and fullness and satiety and preference and mindful eating. So those are some of the, the pillar stones um, of normal eating. Then we get into this kind of next area, which we call disordered eating. And everything in this purple box, I'm not suggesting that anyone who eats in this way has disordered eating. But I am putting a question mark there because we know that the minute we start eliminating any types of foods from our diet, it can set us up to start get more obsessive. And so therefore motivation is a very important piece here. But, you know, we've seen people who are on elimination diets and then they start to get really obsessive. Um, and you'll notice that I have um, put a square box around veganism um, as possibly a form of disordered eating, not for everyone. I'm not making blanket statements, but for certain individuals, these eating styles could get them in trouble. And we know from the research again, that again, when we eliminate any particular food, even, even and mostly it's because of health reasons, um, it can start to get on a slippery slope. So that's what I'm referring to. And then at the end of the spectrum, we have a full-blown diagnosable eating disorder. I think most people are familiar with the, the main three, anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating. Um, and now we have ARFID, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, otherwise known as AKA picky eating. People may know that. And OSFID is an umbrella diagnosis um, for people who are who have these tendencies but it doesn't quite meet frequency or duration um, but certainly it's very disruptive and uh, having negative implications on their life now the box below that uh, that has orthorexia at the top these are other very very disruptive and very uh, detrimental eating uh, behaviors that we've seen enough of in the field that we've actually got these names for them None of them have a diagnosable code yet, but certainly there's a lot of data that's now being put together to support, um, support some of them, including orthorexia. So orthorexia is at the top of the list there. Um, the others um, you've probably heard of for guys, bigorexia or muscle dysmorphia, trying to bulk up. 
uh, but diabulimia is when we have clients on insulin who are deliberately not taking insulin so that they can uh, lose weight and control weight that way. Drunkorexia often seen in college students not eating much during the week to save calories for binge eating on binge drinking on the weekend. Not so much of that going on with COVID right now. Pregorexia, unfortunate term, but really describes many, many clients um, that we've seen actually women who have gone through a pregnancy and uh, then start to struggle with a full-blown eating disorder during pregnancy, which is just heartbreaking. So author, orthorexia nervosa, that, that term that I circled there, what exactly is it? It's an obsession with eating foods that one considers healthy, but the obsessiveness is to a point that the pursuit becomes unhealthy and even life-threatening, i.e. what we often will see with this particular um, eating disorder is that clients will start to lose weight to a point that they become medically compromised. It's an inability to see the detrimental impact of the eating behaviors because there tends to be a, um, a mental health piece, a decline in insight and uh, a decline in uh, cognitive functioning, a rigidity in willingness to change uh, any behaviors. So there's, there's not a desire to change behaviors and there's a rigidity around food rules that negatively impacts not just health, but also social interactions, life and relationships. So it really becomes very detrimental. So when I'm talking about uber healthy eating, we're talking about when it gets to a place where it's really starting to negatively impact, if not ruin someone's lives, life. So vegetarian and orthorexia similarities. I'm using vegetarian because this was a research paper that I pulled up from 2019. There's very little research that has been done on veganism historically. And only in the last couple of years, really, are we starting to see some research articles. So um, I pulled this one up. It does refer to vegetarianism as opposed to veganism, but I think we're, I want to use it as a, a comparative to veganism for the um, point of today's presentation. So on the left, a vegetarian diet, what is it? Preoccupation with consuming meat-free meals. And the main goal is very often ethical reasons. Great, love it. The box on the right-hand side, the far right, orthorexia nervosa, what is that? As we just said, it's a preoccupation with consuming healthy and pure foods. And the main goal is to be healthy. I love both of those, right? Again, the motivation comes from a really good place, I think. The similarities between the two, where's the overlap? Specific food selection. Okay, so we're consuming healthy and organic foods, that's fine. We're making eating related issues an important area of one's own life, okay. We're focusing on quality of food intake. Again, I don't see a problem. Reduction of food intake according to specific nutrition rules. Okay, but we need to maybe put a question mark on that because we know it can lead people down a slippery slope. Nutrition rules, specifying which foods are allowed and which are forbidden. Now, when we start to have food rules, we know that obsessionality increases and negative self-talk also increases. This is a phenomenon that has been observed. So again, I'm putting a question mark or a flag on that, okay, as far as is my client now starting to ruminate in a negative way? Is this starting to feel a bit toxic? Rigid food rules and an inability to remain flexible in one's eating habits. That is what we're seeing, again, from the research, from doing some really great questionnaires, et cetera, that they saw as an overlap between these two eating styles. How are we doing there as far as any questions so far from the audience, Leslie? Leslie, you've got your mic off. Yep, I know, I'm just putting it back on. <laughs> I have one here um, from Michelle. Um, just. What about the influence in the yoga community as Westerners are doing more yoga that strongly promotes veganism? That's one of the questions. Yes, it does. And that's actually where we think from the yoga community, we actually think um, that's actually where we first started to see ortho orthorexia is actually in uh, the yoga community. Um, and I think because of the recent food trends, it makes sense that we're going from that focus on really healthy eating that we would now be kind of doing, practicing more veganism. Um, so there are actually populations that are more at risk, at risk. I mean, where there's greater prevalence 
of following a certain eating pattern. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but we just need to be a little bit careful because for some susceptible individuals, it can, it can lead to something way more dangerous. For example, um, I'm a registered dietitian and we know from research studies that registered dietitian students, nutrition students have a disproportionate, a disproportionate percentage um, actually have orthorexia. It's something like 60 to 70% of nutrition students uh, display behaviors similar to orthorexia. That's that's just staggering in my book. And I think it's, it's understandable because we're studying optimizing health through food and nutrition. So of course, everyone is gonna to try to practice what they preach and probably comes to the profession with a predisposition to be interested in that. Um, but again, it can get really, really um, take you down a slippery slope. Um, okay, in the Q&A box here, uh, okay, so that was from Michelle about the yoga community. Um, okay, uh, any articles or studies to bring to our attention about veganism and negative effect on gut microbio, uh, microbiota? Absolutely, Laurie, we know that when we decrease the diversification in what we're eating, it has a, it has a negative effect on the gut. Uh, microbiota, which is our, you know, gut bacteria, healthy bacteria. Um, so again, we just need to be careful that if we are eating in a vegan way, we're just not eating four or five key things. We, we have to make sure that we're including a great deal of variety in our foods, particularly fermented foods, etc., cetera, um, because otherwise you're going to be missing out on some of those essential, essential nutrients. Um, and Another question I have here is what if individuals are celiac and then choose veganism? Does a restrictive illness promote this disorder? I'm going to answer that a little bit later. So to move on then, um, this Venn diagram here is a diagram that comes from a research paper from 2015. And it's comparing now, we're going to go to the next step. We talked about vegetarianism and veganism and orthorexia and the overlap. And what I'd like to do now is talk about the overlap between orthorexia and anorexia, which as we know is a full-blown diagnosable eating disorder. The third um, yellow circle here is um, looking at OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder. OCD is actually uh, on the spectrum of anxiety, just very simplistically. And so really what I want to say is that there's a great deal of anxiety that is underlying both orthorexia and anorexia. And I wonder if that's the same that we're seeing with veganism, whether people who are a little bit more anxiously oriented are also more inclined towards some of these um, experimenting with different food plans. I don't know. I'm just proposing that as a possible hypothesis to consider. So let me focus here, though, specifically on orthorexia and anorexia. Leslie, I might just mute you. There we go. Um, orthorexia, as we said, as you know now, focus on food quality, not calories. Unrealistic food beliefs, again, because it's at that obsessional stage. A desire to maximize health and often will flaunt behaviors. I mean, how, how many people do we know who are like, well, I eat this and I eat that and I don't eat this. And you're like, please go away. Um, and now an anorexic in comparison focuses on food quantity. I don't wanna eat too much. A fear of obesity or, or gaining weight, a disturbed body image. Now, notice this fear of gaining weight and disturbed body image is not part of the orthorexic profile. Drive for thinness, excessive exercising. Okay, so those two seem very separated. What they do have in common, according to this Venn diagram and this research paper, is limited insight, guilt over food transgressions, and it's egocentric, meaning that it aligns with self image, like. I'm, I have a lot of control and I like to be a certain weight and I'm very good at this and I exercise a lot or I eat very healthy and these feel very good. Now, in the middle here are some traits that are, are, are quite concerning that fall into this more obsessive piece, perfectionism and how many of us know how detrimental that can be when applied in the wrong area, 
cognitive rig rigidity, trade anxiety, impaired functioning, poor external monitoring, impaired, wor impaired working memory. Um, so, so as we can see here, there seems to be a clear delineation here but I'm gonna confuse you a little, I don't mean to, but what I've started to notice and what many of my colleagues have started to notice is that orthorexia is becoming a part of anorexia. So we're gonna see that on the next slide where we're seeing orthorexia with weight loss starts to manifest into a form of anorexia. And what, what I believe may be one of the mechanisms here is that we know uh, now, the current theory is that for an eating disorder to basically, you have to have a genetic predisposition to develop an eating disorder. If you have that genetic predisposition, if you lose weight below a certain biological level that your body is meant to be at, our current um, theory is that it switches on the manifestation of the eating disorder through how the brain starts to then work. And we know actually from just just under eating and just losing weight will also bring on a lot of the um, psychological behaviors that look like anorexia, even if you don't have that predisposition. So that is the, the suspicion there of what the pathway is that orthorexia can very much lead to anorexia if it's not caught and treated, particularly if weight loss starts to really um, occur. Uh, Melanie, can you hear me? It's Leslie. Pardon? Uh, can you hear me? I just have a question that Absolutely. came in yeah. and it's sort of relevant to what you're talking about now. So maybe to uh, we can weave it in yes. uh, during this part. It's from Jamie and yeah. he says, for someone who considers themselves a healthy eater at the moment, are there some key behaviors that stand out as quote gateway or slippery slope behaviors? Is Absolutely. that focus already too much or is it a combination of that focus and something else? So it just seemed... Yeah, that. absolutely. No, um, because if you start to put all this together again, you know, the idea of I want to eat as healthily as I can, because I want to be the healthiest version of myself. I think that's a great, a great goal, right? And so then it comes down to checking with yourself, how rigid am I getting? How much of my identity is getting caught up on this? How much of my time? And actually, Jamie, a little bit later on in the presentation, I'm going to walk everyone through nine key questions um, that Tammy and I came up with, well, actually, Jessica Setnick started out with an initial five questions, screening questions, and Tammy and I have added to those questions. Um, and I think those questions are a really good way to assess, um, is this, is my, our, is my attitude to my eating plan um, healthy? <laughs> Uh, or is it starting to get obsessive and leading me down a slippery path? And I think those questions may help to um, further shed light on 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 uh, on where you may be in that process. So let's um, we'll get to those in a moment. Thank you for that question. So let's have a look now, guys. We're going to go into veganism challenges. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I think we're okay. Veganism definitely can be socially a socially acceptable way to be restrictive we know this it can be smoke and mirrors and it also can be hey this is my core these are my core values how can we better evaluate if veganism is a healthy choice or something not so healthy exactly what you're asking jamie so this is a very busy slide i apologize but what i'd like you to look at here is these one two three six six columns uh, the first one being nutrition relevant, ability, resilient, balance, result. And the top line here, these boxes are about what, what is productive around food preferences. If you're making decisions around eating and uh, your, your question is um, the way that I'm eating and the foods I'm excluding, is this still in the realm of healthy or is it starting to become destructive? And these questions are a really great guideline to that, exactly what you asked. So first with nutrition, can you stay well nourished without this particular food item? Or without it, you can't get all the fuel or the nutrients you need. Okay, so that right there, unfortunately, does raise the flag for veganism because we know that there are some essential nutrients that you don't get. That doesn't mean it's destructive. It just means we need to be aware and is there a way around that? And if there is, then we can address it. 
relevant. Excluding it makes sense in your current situation. Sounds good to me. Destructive, you exclude it because of a trend, a celebrity, or a past diet. Hmm, big question mark, right? Ability, you're prepared to exclude it completely without shame. Or you have cheat days, you binge eat, or you eat differently with others, okay? That tells us that there's a lot more going on. So for example, um, if you have celiac, celiac and you need to take out gluten, it's a medical need. So therefore you wouldn't eat anything that has gluten in it because you know it'll make you sick. Or have you gone gluten-free and, um, and you have cheat days and binge days and when you do do that, you eat gluten, which is what we often see with our clients. There's inconsistency. Resilient, you're prepared for the occasional accidental glitch. So if you're vegan and you eat out, when we used to eat out, and you find out later that the broth was not a vegetable broth, it was actually a chicken broth, are you like, okay, that was not my choice, I didn't know, um, all right, I'm going to let it go, or you punish yourself uh, because of even accidental mistakes. Balance. You can still have other activities and interests, even while following the eating style that you are wanting to follow, or you obsess about food and eating, ruining other parts of your life. Okay. Result. Excluding it improves your mood, condition, or health, or excluding it makes you anxious, sick, depressed, or scared. I love this because it really, I think, really evaluates where you are with the food exclusions that you may be making. Again, food exclusions in and of themselves are not a terrible thing, but we really have to be looking at, is it productive for me, objectively speaking, or is it destructive? And only, uh, um, not only can you answer that, but you, know, you can have a healthcare professional who can help you through that. So our challenges therefore around this for the beliefs, our challenges are first and foremost, the beliefs of the clinician and the beliefs of the client. As I alluded to earlier, or spoke about um, earlier in our field, many of us clinicians felt that veganism uh, for our eating sort of clients was smoke and mirrors. And then we had to really reevaluate our own beliefs around that and put that aside. Our question for our clients around veganism, if they have an eating disorder, is was the veganism part of their life before the eating disorder started or did it develop during? Maybe it's a part of the eating disorder or did this client decide after full recovery they wanted to become vegan? So that's an important piece, as is motivation. Is this for health? Is this actually really for weight? Is it really for the environment and or ethics? And these are the screening questions then, a little bit similar to before, um, but we put these into a questionnaire that we use when we do our initial assessments. So the first one is, are you adequately nourished? Number two, do you binge on this food after previously denying yourself the option to consume it? Three, are you avoiding this food based on fear? Four, do you have resilience when the food is actually accidentally encountered? Again, these first five are similar to the um, columns we saw earlier. Number five, has the elimination become part of your identity? Maybe over identifying there. The next set are what Tammy and I added. Based on zero to 100, how much do each of the following reasons support your decision to become vegan? Health, weight, environment, ethics. Number seven, what other lifestyle changes have you made to accommodate your veganism? And for example, I used the example earlier. I've had clients come in and say, I'm vegan and I won't, I won't go into your treatment. I won't go into treatment with you unless you are willing to um, accommodate my veganism. And I'll notice that they're wearing leather shoes, a leather jacket and have a leather bag. And I'm, hey, it's not up to me to judge, but it does make me uh, ask more about their veganism and what it really means to them. And number eight, would you be willing for medical reasons, specifically brain health, to eat a vegetarian meal plan, i.e. eggs and dairy, during treatment? And number nine, would you be willing to gain weight if necessary? So number eight, I can understand clients saying, no way, Jose. Um, others may be a bit more flexible. Um, and number nine, though, is a real litmus test question because if someone is truly vegan and has lost weight, 
and is not concerned about their weight, the answer to number nine would be absolutely. That's why I'm here. If someone is vegan and it's, it's morphed into something that's more like anorexia, the answer to that will be no, I really don't want to. So again, it's not black and white, of course not, but these are some of how we get at some of the nuances around what this veganism um, eating style is really means to the client. So the next section here is really around the nutritional uh, rehabilitation for our clients. Um, so the first question here is adequate nourishment. And by that, I mean calories. Can we get enough fuel into the body? Our general presentation is the client has gone on to this particular eating plan and they've lost weight and things have started to become um, um, dangerous, actually. Their lab work is out of whack. They've dropped off their growth curve. Women might have dropped, you know, stopped their menstrual cycle. Um, they're starting to become very irritable and, um, and noticing mood swings. So can we get enough calories back in the diet to weight restore? And or if their weight actually hasn't shifted, but they're noticing all sorts of different medical concerns, weight stabilization. So let's have a look. We have a question. Um, Mel, that is right up this alley. Yeah. <laughs> so as you're starting to go through this, um, this is from Matthew um, in our chat saying, even when veganism precedes um, an eating disorder and seems motivated by ethical and or environmental concerns, are there times when we will still need to ask these patients to temporarily temporarily suspend acting on their valid belief systems due to the need for adequate nutritional restoration. And that's so, what I'll get to now. That's what we're going to talk about yeah. now. So I just wanted to bring the question so that, you know, can um, nourishment be provided? So can um, nourishment be provided? Exactly. And that was really, honestly, the main, that was from Matthew, was it? That was the main question that we asked, Matthew. Um, no matter the, the core ethical uh, values of the client, can we take care of them? Can we medically and biologically, physiologically, you know, kind of get their body back to a functional place? And the good news is, yes, we can. But it's not that easy. Um, so, um, again, this is a little bit clinical, uh, what I have here. Uh, but this is a sample of a 4,000 calorie weight restoration meal plan that my colleague Tammy Beasley put together. Um, 4,000 calories, many of you may be going, my goodness, but that's about the number of calories um, often clients will need to weight restore if they have been dropping weight. I know that's unbelievable, but it, it is true. Um, and you will be surprised at how difficult it is for our clients to gain weight because the body becomes hyper metabolic as you start to refeed and it actually fights against weight restoration. So it gets pretty complicated. Um, just to orient you to this chart, on the left-hand side, top of the box says meal types. And so we've got breakfast, we've got lunch and we've got dinner. So this is just the meal version. The next slide will look at snacks. And we've got three different types of meal plans here. The first one is just a regular, which means an omnivore, someone who eats meat. The second is a vegetarian modification. And the third is a modification that we would do for our vegans. And as you may notice here, for our vegans, we are relying heavily um, on a supplement, a liquid supplement at each meal. We also do rely on a, a liquid supplement for our regular meal as well. So um, nothing new there. It's very common with that number of calories to include liquid calories because to do all of this with just physical food would lead to such physical discomfort because it's such a large volume of food. Uh, if we can do some of it with liquid calories, it really helps to reduce that GI distress. And then snacks, we've got an A on the left-hand side. We've got an AM snack, a PM snack, and an after-dinner snack. And again, the same three a regular meal, a vegetarian meal, and a vegan meal. And so as you can see here, you know, after dinner snack for a vegan, bottom right-hand corner, Oreos, Oreos are vegan, with a cup of soy ice cream. Um, and I know Leslie actually loves and introduced me to um, coconut ice cream. 
Um, so there's a lot and awesome guys, there's a lot of new vegan products out there. So there's actually no problem now getting the adequate calories. So that's the first point. Can we get the calories? Yes, we can. But again, uh, does that mean we're getting everything that we need? That's the next question. So what we do find though is unsupplemented vegan diets are nutritionally incomplete. What that means is that there are essential nutrients that we can only get from our food that the body can't make that a vegan diet does not provide. And I will go into some detail in a moment. But as a result of that, you absolutely have to supplement in order to be um, in, in order to have adequate nutrition. So essential nutrient supplementation and lifetime, lifelong supplementation is absolutely needed. Um, and therefore, in answer to your question, Matthew, yes, it is possible to weight restore on a vegan diet. Okay, so that's part one, though. So the supplemental piece, though, although we can treat all the medical aspects of an eating disorder on a vegan diet, psychologically, we don't know yet. Um, the psychological prognosis is yet unknown. So that fear of food, um, does that ever go away? Caution with the client never fully recovering if veganism is for disordered eating purposes. So if the client says I'm vegan, but they're actually attached to the veganism because it's a disordered eating way of maintaining weight or helping them with fear of weight gain, if they don't do exposure therapy through that, that fear will never go away. So that's a concern. Um, you want to utilize the hierarchy of food exposures through treatment and ask for a temporary respite from vegan choices during recovery for medical reasons, if possible. As we said, maybe a little bit of dairy, maybe eggs. If the client is really adamant, I'm not going to be disrespectful. We'll work around it. Essential nutrients, physical health, but even perhaps even as important, if not more important, is the brain health. And this is the part two. So essential nutrients that are either lower or absolutely lacking in the vegan eating plan include um, the list below, protein, iron, calcium, zinc, B12, riboflavin, flavin, which is B2, and uh, the good old omega-3. The two for, for um, the purpose of time today, I'm gonna to speak specifically to B12 and omega-3. And I'm also going to highlight around protein, some of the misinformation that's out there um, around what the sources are for some of these essential nutrients. So with these essential nutrients, um, we're doing a comparison of non-vegetarian and vegan nutrient needs. That's often what the research is about. And what we want to ensure is that all biological needs are met so the body can function optimally. It's, that's what we're striving for, right? We're striving for health, optimal health. So if you're not getting your essential nutrients, then what's the purpose? All psychological and mental health needs are met, which means the brain is functioning and it's getting the essential nutrients it needs to function properly. And then there has to be that consideration for volume of food needed for health and possible resulting GI. Because if you think about a plant-based diet, by default, it's much more um, plants and fruits and vegetables, etc., cetera, grains, um, a lot of really, really good stuff, but it can also be very bulky and a lot of high fiber. And what we know is that when we lose weight, uh, it doesn't matter what our start weight is and it doesn't matter what the end weight is, but if you lose weight over time, your GI muscles, the muscles in the GI will atrophy and they will not push food through uh, with the same um, tenacity, strength that they do usually. So what happens is people get backed up um, and in addition, there is less absorption because there's less breakdown of your food. So you actually become nutri nutritiously deficient through the, um, through the mechanism of losing weight and losing the integrity of your GI system. So it's, uh, it's multifaceted, as you can see. So let's have a look at some of the misinformation that's out there around sources of certain nutrients. And this is from something called the Give Project, which when I looked at this, I thought, oh, I don't know, somehow they look legitimate, right? They look kind of, I don't know, there's something about it called the project. You think it's legitimate? Check this out. Where do you get your protein? 
So it's, it's saying that you can get 49% of your protein from spinach, kale, broccoli, cauliflower. I'm a nutritionist, I, a registered dietitian. Many of our viewers today may be as well. And when I looked at this, I was thinking, hang on a second, did I miss something in my nutrition classes that I didn't know spinach and kale had so much protein? And when I was a vegetarian, like, what is going on here? Um, and then at the bottom, it says protein in meat. And you'll see that beef is only 25% protein. Chicken is only 23%. Eggs are only 12%. So actually, they're actually on the lower end compared to these vegetables. So of course, get your protein from vegetables. I hope you're picking up on my sarcasm in my voice here. Because the reality, guys, is about bioavailability and also how much is in those products. So let's take spinach. One cup of spinach, it says, has what 30 is actually, it's actually 39% protein. But there's only seven calories in one cup. And therefore, if you take a percentage of that to figure out what the protein content is, one cup of spinach is only going to give you 0.6 grams of protein. You need a minimum of 50 grams of protein per day to meet basic minimum needs. And that, that's not even considering gender and muscle build, et cetera. So that would suggest, so 50 means 100 cups of spinach would get you close to your goal. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm eating 100 cups of spinach, even if it's in a smoothie. And I think you'll see something similar with these other ones here. 2.2 grams in one cup of kale. Uh, one cup of broccoli, 2.6 grams of protein. So again, you would be eating mountains of broccoli and kale and spinach to get anywhere near your protein needs. I would suggest that the average person would not be doing that. Beef, in one three ounce serving, you're getting half of your protein needs in one three ounce, which is just this part of your hand. For chicken, three ounces, half of your protein needs for the day. Again, your protein needs on average about 50 grams is a minimum. Eggs, two eggs gets you, um, what is that, around 25% uh, of where you want to be. Okay. So, again, the, the, the focus or the purpose of these two slides was to say, be very careful about what you're eating. The average consumer, if they don't have a nutrition, any kind of nutrition training, may actually be very, very deceived and be thinking they're eating in a healthful way and in, are, in fact, woefully um deficient in some really really key elements and imagine just physically how you're going to be feeling if you're so deficient so i think that's really shocking and but i think we all know it's no surprise that there's so much misinformation out there on the internet and social media so this uh next slide then is okay so what are some really good sources of those uh different uh nutrients i mentioned and this is just a quick cheat sheet um, for a vegan eating plan where you can get some of those key elements from. I'm just going to leave that in the pile here. I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but just know it's there if you want to refer to it. Um, one key thing I wanted to say here is that um, iron, iron, most good sources are fortified and B12, they're all fortified. And I'll talk to you about that as we go along here. So as I said, there were two essential nutrients I want to focus on because not having them and not supplementing, supplementing with them has major impacts on your brain functioning. And we definitely want to make sure that our brain is getting back online. And when we're talking about recovery from an eating disorder, we don't want to just weight restore someone who's lost weight. Um, or we don't want to just get someone to weight maintenance um, if they're struggling with bulimia or binge eating disorder. We want to make sure we're helping to renourish and repair the brain. And we can only do that if we have the essential nutrients. And we're missing a really big piece if we don't think about the brain renourishment as well. So um, plants provide inadequate amounts of B12. B12 is actually produced by bacterial action in plants. And then it's transferred and accumulated in animals because animals eat plants and then it gets concentrated in, um, in animal tissue. Animal products, therefore, are considered a good source. So that just means about how much is available when you eat that food item. We need B12 for the synthesis of DNA, RNA, 
red blood cells, and perhaps, um, again, equally importantly, myelin. Myelin is the stuff that wraps around our, our brain cells and makes sure that the, brains, the brain cells are communicating appropriately with each other and transmitting signals. Pretty essential stuff. That's white matter in the brain. B12 deficiency can cause serious psychiatric problems, including depression, psychosis, memory problems, mania, changes in behavior or personality. Severe prolonged B12 deficiency is fatal. So it's not to be messed with there, guys. And according to studies, as many as 86% of adults, regardless of chosen diet, are deficient. Vegans, on average, tend to have the lowest B12 levels. Um, there are trace elements found in algae um, from bacteria, from the bacteria that live within the algae, and I've done some research on those, and so there's all these B12 algae supplements out there, but they're actually not regarded as an adequate source. And also just know that the supplement industry is unregulated. So if you are a vegan and you're taking algae B12 supplements, I would strongly advise that you have someone who has some nutritional background to just check that for you to make sure that you're actually getting what you need and it is bioavailable, meaning that the body is able to actually absorb it and digest it. Otherwise, you could be taking something that is not helpful at all. Now, the Vegan Society, um, I cited them earlier, they've done a really nice job on really um, uh, laying out the things that a vegan would need to be careful of and make sure that they're doing in order to be adequately nourished and therefore optimizing health as a vegan. So I was really impressed with um, what they have on their website. So definitely check that out. Um, but their recommendation around B12, um, I was very pleased with because they're not messing around. And they said here to get the full benefit of vegan diet, vegans should do one of the following, eat fortified foods, two or three times a day to get at least three micrograms of B12 or take one B12 supplement daily or take a, a weekly B12 supplement. Um, and of course you can get B12 shots. So that's a little bit around B12. And I know it's a bit controversial for our, for our vegans as far as the source. Okay, moving on to our next slide. Leslie, were there any questions there that um, might be helpful to answer at this time? Well, there's a lot of questions. Um, I, uh, there's one that is just, I think, a really interesting one that weaves throughout the uh, talk um, that mostly you've been talking about um, eating disorders a little more on the restrictive end and anorexia and, and so on. But are there, does veganism um, go part and parcel with all eating disorders, including binge eating and all eating disorders? Do you see vegans with various eating disorders? Absolutely. The answer is yes. It's across the board. Yeah. Another, another question, we'll just, just, it's nice to take a pause and answer some yeah. questions so that people are not bothered with new information. Yeah, go ahead. Um, here's, here's one sort of relevant to what you're talking about. Um, uh, hold on a sec. A lot of my clients struggle with bloating and it seems they are vegan. Is this likely due to their high fiber diets? And, uh, yes, a combination of the high fiber diet and also if they have been restricting calories, we know that their um, intestinal system, the, the muscles that make up the intestinal system start to break down and are not getting repaired. So the whole system starts to slow down. And as a result of that, the food is in the GI system for longer, which means it has more opportunity for bacteria in the GI to, to, to work on it, which causes more gas and therefore more bloating. So it's a double whammy. Um, which is why you need to be very careful. So again, if you were to pursue a vegan eating plan, just make sure that calorically it's adequate for you, meaning that you're not losing, losing weight. And that I think is the catch because I think that a lot of people from what I've observed anecdotally and seen on social media are adopting a vegan eating plan because it's healthy for sure, but also because there's a strong desire to lose weight. And I understand that. But what people are not realizing is that that weight loss can actually become quite detrimental. And one more a quick question about the B12 that you were just talking about. Yeah. Nutritional yeast appropriate for B12. 
Well, yeast again is a, is an organism, so it becomes a small organism. So it comes down to how much B twelve is actually in uh, is in the yeast, and is it enough? Um, and it would suggest that any of the the yeast and the algae, um, those sources of B12, uh, from what I've read, are inadequate um, at this stage. Um, so unless someone maybe has something different that they've seen or, or some improvement has come out with the way they're doing this in, in the lab, um, then we'd love to hear about that. Other questions? Um. I think we'll, we'll continue. continue and we can get to them at the end yeah. so essential fatty acids so this is um we all hear about omega-3s we all know eat more salmon um etc so these omega-3s we know they're good for us but what exactly are they good for us for so the essential fatty acids essential again guys means that the body doesn't make them we can only get these particular chemicals um, or constituents from the diet. And so if we're not getting it out of the diet and the body can't make it, we're in deep trouble because we become deficient and that can lead to major health consequences, if not death. So essential fatty acids are DHA and EPA. I'm not gonna go into all the fancy definitions, but just uh, hang on to those two acronyms. Vegan diets contain none of DHA or EPA. Okay, now omega-3s are required for brain and immune function, particularly important in the time of COVID. And also know that vegetarian diets also are problematic because they contain only, only small amounts and the sources there are eggs and dairy. So our vegans and our vegetarians alike need to be careful around how am I going to get my omega-3s. Now, the brain is extremely rich in DHA, one of these essential fatty acids. That means that the brain needs a lot of DHA and it's essential, meaning we can only get it from the diet, the brain can't make it. So we've got to figure this out. So the DHA is actually required to make the, the myelin sheaths in combination with B12, we spoke about that earlier, so important with proper functioning of the brain. Um, the DHA keeps the cell mem membranes fluid and flexible so that neurotransmitters can, can um, transmit along the nerve fiber. DHA is also critical in the formation of healthy synapses, so how those brain cells uh, communicate with each other. Um, and therefore, infant brains require lots of DHA to develop properly. And I would suggest that this is probably the biggest point around why it's not okay to have our infants and young kids on vegan diets um, unless we're super, 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 super careful. And I, I would be really really um, wanting to recommend against that unless, um, as I said, unless there's maybe a registered dietitian who knows what's going on around that. DHA, DHA is essential for organized neural signaling um, and omega-3 supplements rich in EPA seem to have positive effects on people with major depression, bipolar, and those at risk for psychotic disorders. Bioavailability, okay. Um, the next one. So bioavailability is it's not just enough to say, yes, um, spinach has B12. It's but how much of it is there? And also, can the body break it down and access it? That's what bioavailability means. And the form of omega-3, ALA, ALA, found in plant foods such as flax, chia, walnuts, etc., it's actually difficult for the body to convert, convert to DHA. And this next diagram should show us what that means. So essential nutrients, we've got this ALA from plant sources. So this is what most of our vegans are getting. It's the only source that our vegans are getting because they're not eating marine sources. So ALA comes in from, from plant sources, chia, walnuts, etc. but only five to 10% converts to EPA. Oh boy, that's not a lot. And then of that EPA amount, only two to 5% of that converts to DHA. Remember, DHA essential for the brain. So we've really got a very, very poor conversion rate to get enough DHA. It's really tough guys. So you have to be really, um, really focused on this and really know what you're doing here to make sure you're not depriving your brain unintentionally of essential omega-3s. And then just some stats for you. 
Um, those EPA levels and DHA levels, both low, no surprise in vegetarians and the lowest in vegans compared to omnivores, uh, which, you know, as you can see here, um, significantly low in our vegans. And then there's a gender difference, which I thought was interesting. Uh, women convert only about 9% of the ALA. Remember, ALA is the source from plants. Um, only 9% gets converted into DHA. Whereas for men, that's even less, zero to four percent. So there's a gender difference, which is so interesting to think about. So that means I the takeaway from that slide is that guys are need to be even more vigilant um, than than women even. So this brain piece we've talked about B12 and we've talked about omega threes um, around um, essential functioning for the brain, and there is one other. Um, component to this piece around brain health and that is cholesterol and um, as you may know uh, from health studies um, cholesterol is only found in animal products so if you are not eating any animal products you're not taking in any cholesterol whatsoever now interesting fact but our liver actually makes cholesterol um, so if you're a vegan, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have low cholesterol, but there is a factor here that the cholesterol that our body makes in the liver cannot get to the brain. And the brain is about 20% cholesterol. It absolutely needs cholesterol. There's a, a very sophisticated blood brain barrier that protects our brains from most things. So a lot of stuff that's in our blood system doesn't actually get access to the brain. Thank goodness, um, because it would be quite toxic. It's the same with cholesterol. Cholesterol is a really big molecule um, and it, it can't get through that blood brain barrier. Now, fortunately, the brain is therefore able to make its own cholesterol. And cholesterol, as I mentioned, makes up about 20% of our brain mass. It's absolutely essential. Who knew that cholesterol was such a, an important piece, right? We hear only bad stuff about it usually. Um, so that's a key thing then that if you're a vegan, don't panic, don't worry. Um, your brain will make cholesterol from whatever you're eating, whether it be carbs, fat and protein, it will be able to um, reconstitute those and, and make cholesterol. Cholesterol is not essential. As we said before, you don't have to eat it in the diet in order to produce it. So that is a major factor for when we realized, Tammy and I, knowing this important piece, um, because we had heard at lectures that, in fact, because vegans don't taking cholesterol that it was actually uh, not appropriate to treat vegans because we couldn't restore the brain. But when, upon further investigation, when I saw this research, we realized we could. And so um, want to reassure people that the brain can be re-nourished in the way that we've just outlined um, earlier. Studies on that we don't have yet though, but we know that the essential nutrients can be provided. All right, so that cholesterol, plant foods, as I said, contain zero grams of cholesterol. Vegan diets probably do not cause low brain cholesterol. We don't think so. The cholesterol in our brains, as I said, doesn't come from the cholesterol we eat. It's too big and bulky to cross the blood brain barrier and um, it can be manufactured out of every, anything, excuse me, the main macronutrients. So that's just a reiteration of what I just said. One more quick thing, Mel, um, yeah. back to the omega-3s. Um, I'm not sure if you, you may have answered this, but what does one do? Um, are there vegan omega-3s that you can purchase? This is another question um, that are made from like flax oil or made with non-animal products. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're, they're getting better and better at making very concentrated um, supplements. Um, and and um, so you can definitely check that out. And again, I'm sorry, but I always wave a little flag of warning because supplements are an unregulated industry. The FDA doesn't oversee them for quality and that what's in, in the pill is actually in the pill as per the label and such. So you really wanna be getting a reputable brand or at least check out some reviews or check out consumer reports on, an, on good vegan omega-3 um, supplements. So make sure you just do your research. But yes, that is a good, a good, um, a good avenue for you. Depression rates then. The association between depression and vegetarian diets is, is controversial. 
Um, but we do know that depressive symptoms are associated with any type of exclusion of any food group from the diet, um, in, ex, including but not restricted to animal products. So for example, I was working up at the Celiac Research Center here at Columbia with Dr. Peter Green, and he was telling me that it's very typical for a client who's newly diagnosed with celiac, who cuts out gluten, to become very depressed because of that change in their diet and what it means to having to think about their meals a lot more and planning and social implications and such like that. So I just want to caution that, um, you know, elimination diets can have other consequences. So the bottom line is that there are unique challenges to treating a vegan client for sure, but not unlike other challenges, such as with the gluten-free client. And with the nutrition knowledge we have, we can treat vegan clients and we can treat them very ethically in that respect. Um, and weight restoration, if that is needed, is possible. Uh, and certainly for our binge eating disorder and bulimic clients where weight restoration may not be a part of the picture, but maybe um, weight stabilization and, um, and uh, food patterns are. And so we can absolutely accommodate that. Brain health can be restored as well through appropriate supplementation as we outlined here today. And also further with our assessment questions, I think we can get a much better sense of the underlying reasons that a client chooses veganism. Um, but we also know that questionnaire, questionnaires are not foolproof. Um, if a client is vegan and refuses treatment because we cannot offer a vegan eating plan, Research tells us that a client will not present again for treatment for another two years. And I, I mentioned earlier that I heard that particular um, quote at a conference several years ago, and that really made me stop and pause and think about we need to think outside of the box here and approach this in a different way if we can. So as we all know, in the field, two more years in an eating disorder makes the prognose, prognosis worse. So our call to action, that's from Tammy and I, is with the nutrition knowledge we have and the abundance of cases, because, you know, if, if so many of the population are following a vegan diet, we, surely we can't turn them all away based upon that one fact. Can, so our question is to our field is, can we lean in and offer a vegan eating plan during eating disorder treatment to meet our clients where they are? And as the brain comes back online, as it's renourished, the client will then be capable of being discerning around if the veganism is truly ethics or in fact, if it is merely smoke and mirrors, but that is, you know, something that can be uh, figured out later and doesn't have to prevent treatment from occurring um, initially. So guys, that's the end of our presentation today. Um, and I am aware though, that with all I've discussed today, it's about a very particular type of eating pattern. Um, and I do want to just let people know that in this um, absolute over, overload of information and what we should be eating and not eating and yes, eating and no eating, this one pager here is a consensus statement on healthy eating from a nutritional panel of experts that I found online recently. It's a nonprofit where a lot of the, the health and nutrition experts globally have gotten together and said, let's put out a position statement to just help the general public uh, get a sense of, you know, what do you need to do and what don't you do? Don't you need to do more of a commonsensical, this is what the research says, and get some balance back and some reassurance. And it's really simple there. And I've underlined perhaps the key piece, the second paragraph, which says, uh, strong evidence shows that it is not necessary to eliminate food groups or conform to a single dietary pattern to achieve healthy dietary patterns. And you can read the rest. I've, I've um, left the, um, the link there for you. So just as a little bit of a, okay, I'm feeling you know all over the place with what should I do and shouldn't, that hopefully will ground us and bring us back to some kind of sense of, uh, of balance, as I like to say. Um, and now we're going to take some questions. And um, I also just want to let you know about some of our programming here at Balance. We have lots of different programs from very intensive day program right through to groups once a week 
to one-on-one -on -one therapy and nutrition services and meal support. And we definitely treat all vegans um, and clients struggling with orthorexia as well as the um, eating disorder uh, that we eating disorders that we spoke about earlier. And we also have a free complimentary call that you can make with our admissions team. Um, if you give a call, you can get a 20 minute um, free discovery call with our team. So Leslie, I'm going to take questions now. Sorry yeah. about that. I'm Barking in the background. <laughs> There's so many. I'm trying to, you know, we won't have time to to cover them all. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, hmm. Okay. Can a client whose ve veganism led to anorexia in high school and is now 23 return to live with her now vegan family members who do not have eating disorders? The client is now vegetarian, but can be triggered by the family members. Hmm. So it's about being recovered and maintaining veganism, I, I believe. Could you repeat the question, Leslie? Sorry. And a client whose veganism led to anorexia in high school and is now 23, returned to live with her now vegan family members who do not have eating disorders. So kind of how is that going to affect her recovery? I guess if, if it I was think it depends on where she is in her recovery. And if, um, if she's able to be around um, people who are eating in a vegan way, um, though I think there's so much overlap between vegetarian and veganism that I wonder whether, you know, a conversation with the family around, can we eat these meals and these meals because those are the easiest for me and not triggering that we can all enjoy. And um, maybe I, I need to make sure there's honey or there's some other foods that I like to eat. Um, is that okay? So really some forward thinking and some good communication. And if that kind of communication is not possible, it may not be helpful to be staying with the family if that's possible as well, because you have to protect your recovery. Okay. Another one, um, typical vegetarian diet followed by uh, Indian people include at least three to five servings of legumes. Do you think they are getting adequate protein? Yeah, there's a lot of great evidence um, around legumes and beans being really great sources, uh, especially in those quantities where it becomes quite a, the bulk of the meal. Um, so yes, I, I believe so, yeah. And here's one we've been talking about people eating vegan products or vegan a vegan diet for health reasons but do you find that there that quite a few vegan products are highly processed like yes. some shakes yeah and that's what we're seeing now and I, I say that with a smile because it's it's um ironic in the sense of people who are moving more towards veganism in the sense of uh, moving away from animal products etc um, and one would think, again, this is where our assumptions come in, that therefore it's more whole foods and uh, fruits and vegetables and real foods that you can actually uh, name <laughs> that you find at the green market. Um, but now the food industry, because they're out for a profit, have made all these processed vegan foods, which make it very convenient to be a vegan. But then it begs the question, and am I just eating now more processed foods than I ever did before. Only you can determine that, but it is worthy of, 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 um, of questioning. Mm -hmm. And here's one, what percentage of vegan clients you've treated are vegan truly due to ethical reasons versus an eating disorder? And that goes into also the, the different reasons for why one, one is vegan. So some yeah. are for ethical reasons, some for environmental, some for, but it, I guess it's sort of what percentage is, is sort of the eating disorder and what's the, you know, and sort of absolutely that out. And, and, and actually, I think that um, what we've found, um, you know, we haven't done any long-term studies on that because our clients are with us for such a short period um, in our, in our um, intensive programming. So we don't really get a sense to then ask them a year or two later as their kind of their brain speci especially come back online. But there is some, um, some research that's looked at this over a couple of years and it's suggesting that about 60% of vegans when that study was done, which was a few years ago, before it became as, as trendy as it is now, uh, about 60% of people uh, maintain their veganism, um, but about 40 or 45% were, you know, my veganism is part of my eating disorder. 
I wonder, because of the trendiness of veganism for the reasons we discussed today, whether there might be a lot more people who are adapting or adopting a vegan um, lifestyle because everyone else is and are not heavily invested in it. And it is more about their weight and therefore their eating disorder, um, whether we may see that statistic flip-flop around where there will be some uh, uh, core belief, core value uh, vegans, of course, but the larger percentage may be more because it's trendy and they're not as attached to the true values around it. That's just um, a hypothesis, of course, we'll have to wait and see. Go ahead, Leslie. Yeah, I'm just going to say thank you so, so much for a wonderful presentation. I think we're just about out of time. Um, and wanted to say to people, if uh, there's, there's many more questions, I think. And if you would like anything more um, on this topic, please let us know. We're going to be sending you all um, a link to the, to the presentation, um, uh, video presentation. And if you have questions or suggestions, or um, um, please let us know, and we can always um, organize something else around the around the topic. And also, if you are interested um, in more on this topic, uh, Melanie will be presenting with Tammy Beasley at the Meta Con Conference this year on Thursday, May twentieth. It's a virtual conference, and we can send you that information as well. Um, it'll be wonderful, another opportunity to learn more about eating disorders and veganism. Wonderful. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.